thank you so much for joining us today, Jillian. We're, we're so appreciative of you. This is a, a, a moment where, you know, it's happening. Pregnancy and pregnant people's rights right now are such a huge topic that we're seeing take place, not just in Washington, but across the country. Um, and so I just wanted to start off a little bit with a little bit of context around where this act came from um, and why right now it seems like there's this push for some of these changes. For sure. And it's so um, it's such a pleasure to be able to talk about some good news actually coming out of out of Washington and to have it be in the area of reproductive justice to boot um, for sure. Um, so the Pregnant Workers Fairness Act is actually the result of no less than a decade of advocacy um, by the ACLU, by many, many um, partners. Um, and it, uh, it, it is a critical advance in filling gaps in existing law. So a lot of people are aware of the Pregnancy Discrimination Act, which has been in place for 45 years, and that protects people from discrimination because they're pregnant. Um, uh, efforts to secure accommodations, and we can define more what that means, but efforts by pregnant people to get the temporary modifications they needed to do their jobs safely was um, only inconsistently getting um, covered under the PDA. The, the PDA only protected pregnant workers to the same extent that other workers in the um, workplace also received accommodations. So if the employer had some sort of a comprehensive scheme, um, like you were injured on the job, for instance, you could temporarily get a, a, a desk job, um, then the law was generally that that had to be extended to pregnant workers too. That's what the PDA said. But that was inconsistent. A lot of employers were sort of slicing and dicing the definition of who was similar to a pregnant person for purposes of triggering that obligation to also um, accommodate pregnancy and courts were often agreeing. Um, and a lot of people know the Supreme Court decision from a few years back, the Young versus United Parcel Service decision. I think a lot of people thought that was going to resolve the issue. We as advocates certainly did hope that that would um, resolve the issue and it really um, didn't. There was a study done by one of our partner organizations um, a better balance uh, studying in the years after Young that two thirds of people who challenged denials of needed accommodations during pregnancy were not getting them. Courts were ruling against them. So that was the PDA. Then a lot of people know about the Americans with Disabilities Act, but um, it's very well settled in the law. Uh, oh, and, and the ADA requires reasonable accommodations. And it doesn't have this comparison problem that the PDA has that I mentioned. The problem is that um, a, a, an uncomplicated pregnancy um, and just normal pregnancy symptoms like morning sickness or fatigue or just prenatal visits um, that aren't um, caused by any sort of disabling condition, that wouldn't qualify for accommodation under the ADA. And then the last example I'll give of how law was failing us on the federal level is the Family and Medical Leave Act, or FMLA, which a lot of people know about. Um, well, of course, that only covers leave as an accommodation, right? So you need to stay home for some period of time. You need to be away from work for a doctor's visit. If you needed um, an accommodation that kept you in the workplace, such as um, you know a different schedule or a workspace that was closer to the bathroom or that kind of change, FMLA wouldn't help you. Additionally, you had to have worked for your employer for a full year before the FMLA covered you. So um, that was sort of the landscape we were living with for many years. Um, and it left many, many, literally um, hundreds of thousands of pregnant workers um, out of um, getting the, the temporary changes they needed to stay safe and keep their pregnancies safe. So um, PWFA was the result of tireless advocacy over a decade of um, both bringing forward the stories of workers who didn't get what they needed. And then also actually the business community um, really finally joined forces with us, um, as well as a lot of folks in the, um, you know, quote unquote, um, pro-family um, community, uh, understanding that everybody can be in favor of healthy pregnancies and keeping people working um, so that they can keep getting their paychecks while they stay safe.
it's it's wild in my brain um hearing you talk about some of the the like being able to go to to get your doctor's appointments that you can check to make sure you're so far you know reaching the milestones that you should be reaching as you're healthy or even as you mentioned something as simple as making sure that you are closer to a bathroom if need be as we know when when somebody is pregnant they need they often have bathroom breaks <laughs> like this is just that's biology that's how that works is it was it just a, an issue of people being unaware of of what uh pregnant people needed what accommodations they needed or pregnant people were they unable to voice what it was they needed? It was sort of what was creating these barriers to um pregnant folks being able to have the accommodations they needed i mean it's it's hard to know if it's hard to get inside the mind of uh of an employer that's going to deny accommodations but um you certainly heard defenses from employers about disruptions um, to business or um, uh, that, um, you know, if you had someone who had a more um, serious need, um, like like a, um, a change in a schedule, for instance, employers just saying, we can't do that. It's too difficult. We don't do that for anybody else. So why do we do it for you? Um, I think um, having done this work for a very long time, I can tell you um, that I uh, I think that pregnancy for all of its um, uh, prevalence, you know, 85% of, of working um, women will have at least one child uh, during their careers. Um, so it's really a fact of life. Uh, but at the same time, I don't think our workplaces and um, the cultural attitudes in our workplace have really come up to speed with the fact that it's a normal condition of employment. And um, pregnancy and pregnant people are still sort of seen as looking for special treatment or the exception to the rule. Uh, I can also tell you, having represented a lot of women who work in male-dominated spaces, um, like um, law enforcement officers or firefighters who have needed accommodations, there's most definitely an attitude of, wait a minute, you want to do a man's job? Well, this is what it takes. Sometimes it's dangerous. And um, if you're asking to temporarily be exempted from those um, those duties while you're pregnant, well, gosh, you shouldn't be here. So I think it, I think we chiefly had a, an ad, attitudinal problem to overcome. I, I do think, um, and I, I know from speaking to our, our lobbyists um, who worked on, on, on getting PWFA enacted, you know, by the time the federal statute was passed, um, 30 states, as well as some localities, had some version of a pregnancy accommodation law in place. And guess what? The sky didn't fall. Um, you know, companies in employers in those uh, jurisdictions were complying with those statutes and temporary, you know, pregnancy is a temporary condition. They were able to do it. And most modifications that people need are very minor. And so you saw the U.S. Chamber of Commerce get on board with the PWFA. And so I, I think even, even by the time PWFA was enacted, those kinds of attitudinal shifts were, were starting to happen. And, and we can only hope that with this new law, um, you know, pregnancy and, and needs of pregnant people will just get even more normalized. Julian, I, I, in speaking with you, I can see your passion for this and I love it. And so I just, I wanted to take a moment, if it's okay to step back and ask you, how did you get involved in this type of advocacy work? Was there sort of, um, what is Oprah, the aha moment that you had at some point in your life? Um, I love talking about this because it's, it's rare that you get to see in the course of your career in a relatively short period of time, such a sea change. Um, I've been doing, I've been practicing employment law a long time, but um, it was about, gosh, um, almost 20 years ago that I had my first client who needed accommodations on the job. She was a baggage handler for a major airline. And um, as you might imagine, as a baggage handler, she um, uh, had to lift heavy things all day long. And she sought to be temporarily excused from having to do that and do other things, other parts of her job and, and not do that part of it um, for the duration of her pregnancy. And she was denied. And the employer said, we only uh, make those kinds of changes for people who have been hurt on the job. Um, and you uh, did not get pregnant on the job. And so you do not qualify for that exception. Um, and I saw at that time, I mean, this was in 2005, 2006, that um, the, the law was very much on the employer's side. And uh, that seemed crazy to me because the PDA had been around for a long time. 
Um, and I started developing a practice in that area and, and mostly was representing um, firefighters and police officers. Again, sort of shouting into the void, to be completely honest, um, and, and, and really having a hard time getting traction from reporters, from um, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, from the courts. Uh, and it really really was only around the time of the Young versus UPS decision, which was in uh, 2015. So, um, so, uh, so that's uh, almost 10 years ago at this point, um, that the issue kind of started making its way into the broader consciousness. And, and then, um, you know, there were many, many more um, of us doing this kind of work. But it, it really, I'm grateful to those early clients who told me their stories and trusted me with them because um, and 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 then decided to take their employers on because the law was really not caught up to the reality of the fact that pregnant people are here to stay and they are doing jobs that can sometimes um, you know conflict with the with the realities of pregnancy and and uh, you know we're, we've been accommodating people with disabilities since 1990 and we can do it for them too. So, um, so I, I, I really get my passion from, from the clients who I've, I, with whom I've gotten to work and, and who have trusted me with their, um, with their struggles and who were just trying to have families and earn their paychecks like, um, like men or like, you know, like other people who don't get pregnant. There's something I'm curious about when, when we're looking at, um, I don't know if discrimination is the right word for what pregnant people were facing to not be able to have these accommodations. But um, I think looking at it, we, we know right now our, our nation is facing a crisis of maternal mortality. And then that also then translates um, often into infant mortality as well. Um, how do you see the, the PWFA helping address um, this crisis that we have on our hand? I know just, just last year, I think um, there was a report that was issued of just about how the, the U.S.'s maternal care is devastating compared to other first world nations, our allies. Um, so so how do you see, is, is it possible the PWFA can help address um, this the, the maternal crisis that we're seeing that we also know disproportionately affects black and brown women? Absolutely. And that was definitely um, a, a key component of our advocacy around getting this, this law enacted. Um, uh, black and brown women are uh, disproportionately overrepresented in the low wage, physically demanding jobs that can be really dangerous during pregnancy. So retail workers who stand on their feet all day long or cashiers who stand on their feet all day long or um, healthcare workers, you know, certified nursing assistants who help our loved ones, um, you know, in, our seniors um, in and out of the bath or bed um, uh, or nurses who, who do the same. Um, or uh, custodial workers, you know, the housekeepers who um, clean our hotel rooms or clean our office buildings when we all go home at night. These are all really dangerous jobs in terms of exposure to toxins or just physical demands that can conflict with pregnancy. Um, and so the, and, 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 um, and the, the endanger, um, you know, the populations that are already um, at, at higher risk for poor outcomes um, for themselves and for their babies. Um, but even for for black and brown women who are you know professionals sitting at desks, um, that um, as we as we know full well, um, you know being in a higher income bracket doesn't um, doesn't protect you from these poor outcomes. And so uh, it's really um, a critical component in assuring um, um, maternal health and babies' um, health, health of families. Um, and, um, you know, maybe uh, I could, before we go further, give just a, a, a quick thumbnail of what the law actually does um, as sort of a frame for these further discussions. It's modeled on the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, and so it requires that employers make, and I'm going to use air quotes because um, some of these phrases are drawn from the ADA and also are um, the areas where the EEOC's forthcoming regulations are offering the most um, Kind of amplification. Um, the law requires um, quote unquote reasonable accommodations for um, the quote unquote known limitations of a person affected by pregnancy, childbirth, or related medical conditions. 
That language is drawn from the Pregnancy Discrimination Act, which bars discrimination against people affected by pregnancy, childbirth, or related medical conditions, quote unquote. Um, uh, and those reasonable accommodations have to be made unless they would impose an undue hardship. Again, that's a phrase borrowed from um, the ADA. So um, that's what we're talking about here, are reasonable accommodations um, for somebody who has some sort of limitation. It doesn't have to just be someone who is pregnant. It could be somebody who is recovering from childbirth and has postpartum depression, for instance, or has um, postnatal visits that they have to attend to. It can also um, apply um, the related medical conditions definition also applies to conditions prior to pregnancy, whether it's infertility treatment or um, um, menstruation. Um, it, we're also arguing um, that it that it covers um, menopause and symptoms related to menopause, which P.S. Black and Brown women um, suffer disproportionately severe symptoms as well, and it pushes older women out of the workforce. So that's what we're talking about: reasonable accommodations of known limitations related to pregnancy, childbirth, or related medical conditions, unless it would impose an undue hardship. And, and that's a standard, by the way, the undue hardship that, that employers have been complying with and, and understanding what that means since 1990. So, um, you know, 34 years. Did I do my math right? 34 years. It's, it's incredible how um, comprehensive it would be. Um, and something that really stood out to me was uh, when you were talking about even post pregnancy or postpartum because you know in in our research for the switch up we we found that um a lot of the the maternal deaths that were occurring were happening within one year postpartum for women um and then when you look at some of the causes of that uh, um uh, postpartum depression is is very big and and i i know our our, our you know, society still hasn't fully grasped that 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 you know postpartum depression is is a real thing and and needs to be addressed. Um, and that's a whole nother conversation about mental health of where our country handles mental health. Um, but but in going along, I think you said this is like ten years in the making. Um, how did you um or how how do you know? Um, that this uh, uh, language um, and the work to have this was passed. What what had to happen? I mean, this probably it didn't happen overnight. Clearly, it wasn't it wasn't one person coming forward and saying, "Here's what I had to deal with." Um, can you sort of walk through the process of what these last ten years looked like to be able to get to this point now? It's really an incredible success story, and as I said, it is so gratifying to see a concrete enormous problem in the law of a huge gap in the law actually get addressed and get that get that gap closed um, over a relatively short period of time. Um, it, it, it took many different components. Um, as I mentioned before, um, the, the, these gaps in the federal law and, and the losses that pregnant people were experiencing in court and the denials of accommodation that they were experiencing on the job, which, by the way, meant that they either had to leave their jobs, right, to stay safe, or they had to continue doing, doing their jobs unsafely. Um, those people um, were a, a really an enormous reason, and their stories were an enormous resource in this effort, um, because that's what this is all about, is, is real people and the impact of, of a, a shortcoming in the law. Um, I think that the um, tide of uh, state and local statutes that started um, in the in the aughts, um, the mid aughts, um, and and as I said, had swelled to um, thirty, so more than half the states by the time PWFA was enacted. You know, the states stepping in and saying, "Okay, Congress, you're not going to resolve this issue. Um, we're going to do something about it for the people who live here." So um, I, I think that raised consciousness um, uh, among um, employers. It sort of changed the conversation culturally. Wait a minute, why are we? Why is this? even a problem. Of course, we should be um, making it possible for people to continue working safely. Um, and um, and then, as I said, you know, business community um, seeing, wow, the sky isn't falling. Um, we can do this. And furthermore, it really is complicated if 
Um, we are a business that does our business nationwide and we're subject to one set of laws over here in these states, but not over here because we don't have a federal law. So I think that reality and the business community, you know, which is often, um, you know, often has a uh, a cost-based argument um, to raise against new um, labor and employment laws. They were able to say, you know, this isn't really, this isn't hurting hurting business. And in fact, it helps business to keep, you know, to um, lessen turnover, to increase retention and increase loyalty, d diminish the amount of time that people are um, sick because of complications, because they're getting the, the preventive, um, you know, care they need. Um, so, um, so that business case kind of gained momentum as the state and local laws took effect. Um, and then, as I mentioned, there was this really important component of um, the faith-based community coming in and saying, look, somebody who, um, you know, has to make a choice between their doctor's orders to not, you know, do repetitive heavy lifting, not be exposed to these chemicals, um, either you're going to make them quit their job um, or you're going to possibly be setting up um, an incentive where someone might want to have an abortion and not want, need to get an abortion um, to be able to continue working and get that paycheck that their family needs. I absolutely in my career have had clients who have considered um, uh, obtaining abortion care when they didn't want it. Um, because they needed their job so badly and they and they couldn't stay on the job. Um, they couldn't get the accommodations they needed to to keep working. And so what what other choice did they have? So I think a lot of um, uh, folks who might otherwise be on the other side of some of these more progressive measures was able to form common cause with the more kind of um, you know traditional um, women's rights forces, gender justice forces that you you know like the ACLU that you might imagine would be in support of this. Um, it, it, ultimately, it was the stories of the people who were being denied the accommodations they needed that I think really um, got everybody to the table and and convinced them um, that you know this is this is something that um, is is not a heavy lift, um, no pun intended, and um, is really needed because existing legal protections were just not not cutting it. And I, I wanted to ask about this. Maybe this is a little bit complicated, but, you know, we are, is it, is it two years, almost two years post post row um, Supreme Court's decision to overturn um, the federal right to an abortion? When we look now at the, the PWFA, how does that affect um, the reasonable care um, that a, a pregnant person might need, um, you know, obviously there, there are lots of reasons why somebody might have to obtain abortion, including it's not a viable pregnancy anymore, or, or it's, it's going to harm the, the, the pregnant person. How, how, how does the, the overturning of Roe v. Wade affect what happens now, um, for, care such as such as abortion care um and and does the pwfa offer any sort of coverage for that in in its wording um so the pwfa the statute itself does not but um the, part of the statute directed the equal employment opportunity commission which is the federal agency that enforces um, our nation's anti-discrimination laws including pwfa congress directed eeoc to put forward regulations that have the force of law. It's, it, they're, it's, um, they're incorporated into the statutory language. And those are um, um, what we've been um, waiting for, um, for for a number of months now to come out. Um, the EEOC um, published draft um, regulations back in August of 2023, and the final regulations are expected any day now. And um, when those draft regulations came out in August, um, the uh, the EEOC made explicit what previous court decisions over the life of the PDA, the Pregnancy Discrimination Act, has made clear, which is that abortion care is is. Um, encompassed within the definition of related medical conditions, pregnancy, childbirth, and related medical conditions. Um, that has been the case um, since the PDA was enacted in 1978. If someone experiences discrimination because they seek abortion care, 
that has been deemed to be a form of discrimination outlawed by the PDA. And likewise, under the um, Pregnant Workers Fairness Act, if someone requires time off of work to obtain abortion care, um, that is uh, something that needs to be reasonably accommodated unless it would impose an undue hardship. Um, that protection obviously is critical um, in the aftermath of Dobbs. Um, it's always been critical. And of course we should emphasize, and I'm sure you do on your show all the time that Prior to Dobbs, it's not like abortion was readily available for huge swaths of the country. Um, it's it's always uh, required a lot of time off of work um, for for huge parts of the country to obtain abortion care. Um, but um, but in the aftermath of Dobbs and the um, uh, more than you know thirty states um, in the country that now have some form of either an abortion ban or a um, a serious um, curtailing of access to abortion, that people are going to have to travel um, and to obtain needed care. And then let's not even consider the states where there are these uh, medically unnecessary counseling appointments and so forth, so that you need two trips um, to your provider to get needed care. But there are studies out, um, uh, the Journal of the American Medical Association put out a study recently showing that um, in Texas, for instance, post Dobbs, um, the average time, uh, travel time needed to obtain abortion care has gone up by seven hours. That's a full workday, right? And so that means um, that you are going to need at least a couple days off of work um, just to get to and from the facility. So um, you, you know, um, that um, travel time, just like travel time to obtain necessary obstetric care um, is going to be um, covered. That's what the EEOC said in its regulations. We're waiting for the final regs, um, but we fully anticipate that, that that will be in there because, as I said, abortion has been seen as related to pregnancy since um, there has been federal protection um, against pregnancy discrimination. You said um, increase of seven hours and my brain just fluctuated <laughs> hearing that thinking, as you said, that's a, that's a whole work day um, for people. And, and that is just, that that's wild. Um, you know, and I know that speaks more to, to, to where we are right now in terms of legal reproductive care, um, being in, in a post row or, or the Dobbs world that we are in right now. Um, with all of that in mind, is the ACLU and, and other advocates expecting any sort of pushback to the, the PWFA with these new regulations coming out? Um, or is it going to be sort of one of those things where the it, the regulations come out and, and that's it? We, we live with it and do we move forward? <laughs> Um, would that it were true, Cheyenne. Um, uh, there, um, you know, I mentioned that the that the draft regulations came out in August, and um, that was for the purpose of obtaining public comment on the draft regulations. Um, and and so now we're waiting for the the final regs when the EEOC has taken all of those comments into into account and and possibly made changes or or tweaks and and. Um, or not. Um, and at the time that the draft regulations came out, unquestionably, there were some noisy critics who attacked um, the coverage of abortion. There also have been noisy critics from the business community, um, you know, saying, you know, hey, we supported this, but this is going too far in certain respects. Um, you're asking too much of us. Um, certain pushback on what would be considered a reasonable accommodation or what would be considered, um, uh, you know, an undue hardship uh, under under the regulations. So uh, there there is always um, pushback on on you know on, on, uh, sweeping um, new statute like this. Um, and, um, you know, I, I think it is fair to say that, um, uh, when, and I say when, not if, um, abortion is, you know, reiterated as being, uh, something that, um, that employers need to accommodate, um, that, you know, that there will be pushback. I, I will say it's something that we at the ACLU and a lot of our coalition partners 
emphasized in our comments on the regulations um, is that uh, there are um, extensive protections, um, privacy protections for people under the ADA with respect to what they have to tell their employer about why they need um, an accommodation. And um, the same should apply here. Um, in fact, the draft regulations um, were very explicit about um, when it will be reasonable for an employer to seek any sort of medical certification, and in fact that an employer is not um, required to do so, nor um, is it recommended that they do so. They should, um, you know, allow the worker to self-certify their need for whatever it is, time off, a stool to sit on, a, a, a revision in their schedule, that, um, that that discussion, that interactive process, which is really critical, the give and take about what's needed um, and what's okay for the business, um, that that process doesn't have to also include, um, you know, a lot of doctor's notes and certification, chiefly because it's it's not appropriate for an employer to know the ins and outs of the kind of care you're getting. So um, the, the main thing that we've emphasized, and we hope the final regulations make clear, um, employers are entitled to know that you have a limitation that is related to or caused by pregnancy, childbirth, or a related medical condition. So it falls within the PWFA and triggers its protections. Um, they are not um, entitled to know the ins and outs of, of your treatment and, and needed procedures. So I, the hope is that um, this, um, you know, pitting employers and workers uh, against each other around the issue of abortion will, will actually prove to be a non-issue because um, either employers won't make a fuss at all um, uh, and will allow people the time off they need or um, that they will not impose um, intrusive um, medical certification requirements that, that invade people's privacy. Looking at all of this, I, I'm curious your opinion. Um, Again, when you were talking about some of the accommodations that pregnant people need, uh, again, whether that's being closer to the bathroom or saying I have to go to my doctor's appointment, um, do you think um, those who who aren't pregnant or those who who don't know somebody who's pregnant haven't experienced that um, moment yet in their life are aware that these um, issues were facing pregnant workers because I think about um, some of the the work that we've done already on the maternal health crisis and and um, even some of our elected officials saying that they hadn't been aware of it until they came to Congress or until somebody that they knew or care about, cared about brought it forward to them. Um, so I'm curious if in your experience you think that um, the general public who who hasn't had that moment of being exposed to somebody or themselves these experiences are are even aware that this was something that was happening in the workforce? We, whenever we do, um, you know, place op-eds or do blog posts or do other kinds of forward, you know, public facing um, uh, work and, and get feedback from the, from the public um, about uh, these issues, um, th there were two messages that, that came through constantly, which is number one, of course, pregnancy is going to sometimes um, intrude on a job, some jobs more than others. And are you kidding me? This isn't the law already. Um, those were the two messages that really came through. So I think it actually came as a surprise to most people um, that that this was even an issue that people were um, very routinely being denied the usually very minor um, uh, um, modifications that they needed to to um, um, to have a safe pregnancy. Um, so I, I I think that was was actually the message that we were getting most of the time was, are you kidding me? At least from members of the public. Now, I think legislators are all, always a different animal and um you know you need look no further than the demographics of our of our legislators to to um and especially in DC to to see that there might be some people who are not all that familiar with what pregnancy um you know really is all about i let me just say you know I, in in fact we unfortunately sometimes see the the um almost the opposite extreme of um, thinking that pregnancy is so debilitating that why is anyone at work? 
Um, you know, why um, why would you even want to um, uh, continue being a police officer, for instance, um, during your pregnancy? How in the world would you think that you could keep doing this? Um, I, I should say um, right now we are involved um, with our Southern California affiliate and, and private um, co-counsel in representing um, uh, female dock workers in, at the ports of LA and Long Beach. Um, and longshore work, you know, a lot of it is very strenuous and has this very macho, um, you know, reputation. But, um, you know, there are there are um, several jobs that longshore workers do that are entirely consistent with pregnancy. Physically strenuous work isn't even inconsistent with pregnancy um, uh, in a lot of situations. Um, it's just certain kinds of physically strenuous work or frequency of certain physically strenuous tasks. So this is all by way of saying that I think um, uh, we did definitely have some educating to do of lawmakers that um, some pregnancy symptoms are, in fact, you know, super serious and life threatening and maybe even, you know, that qualify as disabilities. But a lot of them are just kind of routine, um, you know, um, annoying or intrusive um, uh, symptoms. And, um, you know, it's and, and to the extent they are more serious, they're temporary. And, um, you know, this is something that that everybody can um, can live with if we just make it, um, uh, uh, treat it as a normal condition of employment. I'll just say one last thing, which is I'm a huge believer in the power of um, law to shape culture. I mean, a lot of times culture shapes law. And you mentioned, um, unfortunately, sometimes legislators or judges, uh, frankly, need to have someone in their lives who has experienced a particular issue for their consciousness to be raised and for them to understand that a law is needed. But I think also that um, that uh, you know shows like yours or other coverage of the PWFA that goes out into the world does um, an immeasurable public service of letting people know this is a problem that has been around for a long time, if you can believe it, and you know, in 2024. Um, and now um, here is this, you know, new kind of regime. Um, let's all get on board together and and make that. Um, you know, make make it make it work, and um, and I think I I um, I think that there's huge potential, given um, how prevalent pregnancy is, um, for that to for that to really happen. Julian, thank you so much for your time today. I, I so enjoyed speaking with you and um, the information that you provided us. Um, we're just we're just so grateful for you taking this time with us today and. We'll definitely um, be be keeping an eye out for for when the regulations come down. I know it's supposed to be really any day now, um, so very very soon, very soon. So we will we'll be keeping an eye on it. But thank you so much for today. Thank you. Really appreciate the opportunity.